أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في مقعد صدق عند مليك مقتدر مقعد صدق عند مليك مقتدر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن الرحمن الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان ولقى الإنسان من صلصال كالفخار وخلق الجان من مارج من نار فبأي رب المشرقين ورب المغربين رب 
رب المشرقين ورب المغربين فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العظيم Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone here and uh, viewers listening at home uh, Alhamdulillah again we are blessed to have another week to gather and to uh, learn and to benefit inshallah as much as we can inshallah So today uh, many of you saw the title uh, the title was donkey ship uh, and clown ship and life as a whole So the first time I actually met Dr. Hani that was the first, uh, this is the first thing that he taught me, the, the stages of donkey ship and how to basically be a donkey, you could say. But a good donkey and one that works hard. But I'll let Dr. Hani, inshallah, explain his um, idea because this is a unique idea from him, I think. Um, so the stages of life and how we should, how we can be effective in our work, I, I guess, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, uh, wassalamu and uh, as Brother Mikael mentioned, from the donkey ship to the clown ship, it's a life cycle of any one of us, of any one of us. But because before that, it's the stage of the incubation or incubator. Incubator is led by the mother. The first 15 years in the life of a child is divided into two parts. First seven years will be totally يعني, managed and directed by the mother. The second seven years will be shared responsibility between both parents, the mother and the father, because the child will be going to school, so the father has to take some responsibility apart from his doing his job. So in these first seven years, we have a say by Hazrat Ali, anhu, say seven by seven. Start to teach your children, actually, before becoming seven, and by the time they are 14, you give them another teaching. After that, too late to teach the children. So you have to start from the very early stages. This is why we look at the incubation or stage as very important in the life of any individual, whether the boy or a girl. And this will be led from the love coming from the mother to the child, from the breastfeeding process, to the cuddling, to the looking after him or her, to doing all these sort of things. The relationship between the mother and the child did not start or is not starting after birth, but starting from the time of pregnancy, the agony, the headache, the backache, then the most difficult part of it will be the child coming out, the pain of delivery. You, brother, don't experience this, do you? No. Okay, I wish you don't. <laughs> but she does. Yeah. Uh, but she gets more blessing of, of having this actually pain, partic particularly the delivery pain. This is the first period of life which where the mother and the father will shape the future of their child as love, caring, and compassion. If we lose this 14 years, the child will be in a difficult situation. The child, and there's a difference between the mother who is breastfeeding and the mother who gave milk to the child by artificial uh, feeding. But it depends on the condition of the mother because some of the mothers do not have milk in the, their breast and some become very difficult and painful. So there's some reasons. But this is the first stage in the life of us, the incubation. The second stage when you become 15, now you start to work hard. We we'll look at the value of the donkey in our life. You like the donkey? 
I like him. Yeah, the horse is a waste of time. Because the horse keep galloping, going nowhere, actually. But anyway, if you like horse, we can make you like horses. And uh, donkey, why I'm talking about donkey? Because donkey is very meticulous, knows where he goes, coming back, and have a system in his life, and very hard working. This stage from the level of GCSE and more, from 15 to 35 or 40 years. If we don't work during these 20 years like donkey, I call it donkeyholic, not workholic. You got it? Donkeyholic. Donkeyholic to get the best mark in GCSE, in A level. Donkeyholic is to go to the university, the best university. Donkeyholic. When you get actually your marks, the A's and others in the university, actually, Don Kaholic, when you start engaging yourself at this young age, 17, 18, 20, 21, in local community work. Don Kaholic, when you look very seriously for the job that you can learn and the job can educate you and the job can shape you and the job can build your career. It's a donkeyholic. By this time, why I'm saying donkeyholic? Because during this 20 years or 15 years, 20 years, we need to absorb as much as we have, can with experience, knowledge to enable us to stand on our feet for the following stage. Donkeyholic does not stop, or the donkey ship, sorry, does not stop at the age of 40. It can be with you or with me the whole of my life, but in different forms. Don't stop the donkeyholic, donkeyholic philosophy. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Not the horseholic, actually. And keep with you. But actually, in these 20 years, when you are young, you don't have the responsibility of having a family. You don't have the headache. You have the freedom to learn, to absorb. You are like a sponge. Very fresh sponge. You can absorb as much as you can. You can, of knowledge, to enable you to move to the second stage with the stage of the wake-up caller, which I call it in Arabic, al-masahharati. Masahharati, you do fasting in Ramadan, brother? Deen? Huh? Yeah. During Ramadan. If somebody comes at night, not here, and wake up with a drum and a stick, if you're especially in Pakistan or in Egypt yeah. or in different parts of the world, Wake up, uh, wake up, wake up, sleepy beauty, and try to make prayer for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why this wake up caller is waking you up? For raising the awareness, for giving you direction, for saving your life. Once you become at the age of 35, 40, with the knowledge that you have, the experience that you have, and the confidence in ourselves that you have will be able to wake up the sleeping people in our community. That's why I call it the stage of Masaharati. The third stage, the stage of the Masaharati, which is a wake up caller. Wake up caller. So from the incubator at home between the mother and father to the donkey ship, which is donkeyholic to the wake-up caller, which is start to actually to tell people around him in the community, around here in the community, you have to wake up and do this for your rights. You have the absolute right to defend your children. You have the absolute right to defend the family. You have the absolute right to defend your community. And this is the wake-up caller, as we call it, we call it nowadays, advocacy. Advocacy, as we have been discussing it in one of our talks, you know, the one you talk about uh, last week, one of the, uh, our sisters from Syria is very specialized in advocacy. And she said that the, the movement of advocacy started nine years ago. I told her, my dear sister, the movement of advocacy is written in the Quran 1400 years ago. She looked at me and said, what? I said, yes. When you go and read Surah Ma'un, Have you seen the one who deny the Day of Judgment huh? is like the one who treat orphans badly. So Allah was looking after the most vulnerable 
individual in the community or the one does not advocate yahud so the word had in quran mentioned 1444 years ago before europe and the america talked about advocacy yeah, so you have to be very proud of quran which has the knowledge of the future or the gates of the knowledge of the future this is actually advocacy so advocacy is something we need to do when we have the knowledge when we have the confidence huh? when we have the experience this is the third stage in our life the fourth stage is the fourth stage exactly as we said today people young people like all of you especially brother dino can i call you dino dino bino <laughs> okay come and sit down with me with his sisters aisha i think one of you oh, no, no aisha offside <laughs> i'm offside <laughs> actually come and sit down and tell, let us discuss something at that time i'll be at the age of maybe 50 60 as a wake-up caller as a donkey donkey what do you call it? donkey ship uh, a member of the donkey ship group isn't it and we sit down together the one who was senior at the age of 50 or 60 with the knowledge with the experience and the younger people if the younger people do not mix with those people who have the experience and do have the knowledge and knows where to go at least they will be lost unfortunately so me dean yes yusra oh yeah, like my my my, my cousin Sumaya? Suman. Suman. And Suman, actually, we sit down together. And they have this open discussion. The open discussion, they give me their concern. As, in this case, is this stage called the blending mixer or blending mixer? Is it blending mixer? The fourth stage called blending mixer. What is the blending mixer is? is when somebody senior sit down with the younger generation to bridge the gap between the generations and start to listen to them, absorb their concern, absorb their ideas, and start to work with them to produce a community product. So we started as incubator, then donkey ship, then wake up caller, then blending mixer, to get this product, but the product belongs to whom? To you, actually, to all of you, because it's your idea discussed together with a senior individual in the community. So when we put the senior and junior together in the same room, we get the wisdom of the elder people and the zeal and the energy and the drive of the younger generation. This product goes to the second stage, which is called the community building the fifth stage called community building community building means that actually after sitting down together as young people with those senior individuals and know what to do as a product having the product will be able and confident enough to go out and try to help our community so in my maturity i go from the incubator stage incubator stage to the donkey ship, to the wake up caller, to the blending mixer, to the producing the product, to community building. But you are going to carry on the second phase because you are going to build the community. Because this is your idea and this is your dream and you put it together. Five, okay, find the five stages. Stage number six which could be controversial, at the age of 70, I'm seven now, you are eight, and she is, are you nine? <laughs> and you are 10, oh my God. <laughs> Our queen, may, may God bless her soul, she is uh, nine and a half, which means 96. Uh, we we'll do what we call uh, community prophecy. 
Because this man or this woman, with all this experience, after working for the community for 50 or 60 or 45 years, will be able to prophesy on the direction of the community for the future. And they can sit down and tell you this direction or this direction or this direction. You know why? Because, not because they've been born like this. Because they have gone through all this massive experience in their life. So they'll be able to prophesy of what is going to happen to our community because they have seen it during the last 30 or 40 or 50 years in their life. Was that what call it a community prophecies or community prophets? Community prophets is not heavenly prophets, is not a prophet sent by God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's nothing. It's just somebody can prophesy what the future could look like. Going from this stage to the clownship, when Dean is passing the age of 65, 70, he will be able to connect back to whom? To the children. You remember last week, we were talking about <laughs> and you responded back to me. Huh? I try to bridge it, keep bridging the gap. As I mentioned it in one of my talks, in the mid-90s, we have our uh, board of international board of management meeting in Birmingham. And I decided that the, the, the trend was how can we raise funds from the children under the age of five or six. Very, very strange, very stupid idea. So I went to hire the Mickey Mouse costume. And I wear it, can you understand? You wear a Mickey Mouse costume to go to chair an international board of management meeting. What a crazy idea. So I went to the room with my head as a Mickey Mouse, the short of Mickey Mouse, and the tail and everything. And everybody did not know who was coming. It was very funny. And actually when I was talking to them, my head goes this way, my body goes this way, and my tail goes backward. And they discovered that was me. I said, why, why are you doing this? I said, this is the way to try to attract the younger children, at the age of three or four or five, to be attracted to the organization. Once the child will cry and sit down, he said, Daddy, I want this lollipop. I want this, this, this. Daddy will have to pay. And the lollipop would become a, to Mr. Mickey Mouse is like myself. So try to go from the incubator stage to the donkey ship, to the wake up caller, to the make, blending mixer, to the producing with the, ship, with, with, with the young people the product, then community building, then going back to the prophecies, then actually doing this clown ship. Why I'm talking about this clown ship? Professor Asalam used to go and ask the younger children in Mecca or in Medina, how are you feeling? How is your little bird? Because one of the children, the little bird died or something, and I was very upset. So he knew how to speak to the little children. And this is what I'm saying. Community worker, like all of us here, should know how he can prophesy as well as how he or she can go back to the clownship stage and make children happy. If you make the children happy, and it's my experience with the animal language, which I'm very good at it. When I went to KPK in Pakistan, I'm Pakistani, but you're all Arabs, huh? You don't look Pakistani, huh? I look Arab. <laughs> anyway, uh, all men, society is all men, no women. And some children came out. I have to break the ice. I don't speak Bakhtun or Pashtun. Bakhtun or Pashtun? Bakhtun. I don't speak Dari. If you go to Afghanistan, it's Dari, it's Pashtun, Bakhtun, as well as Farsi. And very masculine uh, community. To break the ice, I have to make this me, And the children start to laugh. Once the children start to laugh, the parents, start, the fathers, not parents, start to laugh as well. So the, 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 the barriers have been broken and the, the ice has been melted 
and the discussion started. So not because you went up to the top prophecy stage, you don't act on the, uh, what they call it, uh, clownship. And the cycle goes back again. But during this journey, be sure that two things will be doing it forever. It is the donkey ship style, which is hard working, plus the wake up calling, which is advocacy. It will never be stopping because your community needs a lot of advocacy all the time and your community needs a lot of work hard, uh, so uh, working hard, or hard working all the time. This is an introduction of my discussion with you today. If you wish, which stage you are in now? Yeah, I think so, donkey ship. <laughs> donkey ship. No, 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 you passed it. <laughs> now you are actually should be in, uh, in the blending mixer. Yeah, because you keep advising. She keeps advising them. <laughs> but actually, she, she, she's still young. Can get that donkey ship? Can get donkey ship? Yeah, I'll do it. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. No, not donkey. Donkey ship. You did not, you are not qualified from donkey ship to the... Yeah. No, no, the one before that is the wake-up caller. If you are over 40, you should be a wake-up caller. All right, now you're a wake-up caller. And you are? On the donkey ship as well. I missed love it, but it sounds like donkey ship. And I am actually past this, but I'm still doing it. So this is actually uh, something which uh, I was inspired when I was in Ireland last year with the university students to start to talk about the donkey and how to go to understand how to learn from animals, uh, the best of the animals' characters, and we'll be able to build our community through following and observing some of these values and the characters which Allah gave to the animals. Yes. Um, in the donkey in donkey ship stage, uh, you say that you have, obviously a donkey it takes a big load of it. Mm. Uh, should you manage that work effectively? <laughs> Should you just take anything on? It, de it depends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا الله نفسا إلا Allah does not ask you to do something more than your ability. Otherwise, you break your back. Don't keep taking things which you cannot do. Okay. You can be a hard worker, taking responsibility that you can deliver. Not responsibility that you fail to do it. And you have to be realistic on this. Because in this community work, it's never-ending story. Never-ending story. You become a community worker. You become a humanitarian worker. You see, the needs of the people with around you is growing by the second. In the camps, if you look at now Pakistan, for instance, I don't know how many people are displaced. I don't know how many people. It should be millions. Talk about Sudan, the same. We talk about uh, Somalia, uh, it's famine now. You don't know how many people are affected. And each one of those affected, displaced people or refugee in this area has uh, needs and you have to fulfill the needs. So don't take more than you can, and, but be realistic and share the responsibility with others. Because at the end of the day, we need to deliver. If we take more than you can, you will never be able to deliver. And if you have, your back is broken, it will lose you, unfortunately. Yes. In uh, your life, for example, in the, when you first started uh, Islamic Relief, or even before when you were studying medicine, um, how did you, of course, when you were studying medicine, you had the concern of people, yeah. I'm sure. And then how did you, Cooperate both together, even because I think you, when you started the charity, you were still working as a doctor. Yes. So back to this donkey ship stage, is this where you work the most as a donkey, you could say? Yes. I think uh, medicine is very difficult. It needs a lot of time to read, to understand, because every day there's new discoveries. Every day there's new treatment. Every day there's new diseases discovered. And... Uh, I was not a very good doctor. 
medical doctor. I was just like any ordinary doctor, but I was working hard because I've been trained when I was in Cairo in the secondary school. The average working hour, Dino, you, know, you know how many? Minimum 10 hours a day. Minimum. This is actually before the exam, it jumps up to 15 hours a day. And sometimes we rehearse, memorize the subjects, like the Qari. You know, you memorize Quran, you memorize, and this was in secondary school, to get the top marks. That's why I managed to get to the medical school, but it was not the best medical school in Egypt. It was uh, the third or the fourth in, in Egypt uh, at that time, actually. But if you don't do it this way, you will fail. When I came here with this mentality, I was in some of these guest houses, I think in Wales, and in the good old days in Cairo, I used to read with loud voice. And you can imagine sitting in this guest house and everybody in the corridor <laughs> listening to your voice, what you're talking about, because I wanted to rehearse the knowledge. And then I failed many times, alhamdulillah. And uh, so, but without having this hard work, and this time to try to achieve and learn, you will not be able to do it. Nowadays, maybe it's easier to obtain the knowledge, not like our oh God, old days. But as I said last, last week, I think, or the week before, keep using the paper books. Don't ignore them. Google, Wikipedia will not make you a scientist. The textbooks which have been written by knowledgeable people will make you scientists, will make you scholar, and will make you learned leaders. So don't ignore it. Even I mentioned it, I think it's like here or another meeting, you find people in London in the underground standing up, holding the bar with one hand, and holding the book in another hand. As young people, not as old people. So please, please, please do not stop reading the paper book. When you work um, in the humanitarian field, everything, uh, especially for people that are new to the sector as well, uh, they feel that they want to do a lot. They yes. want to change the world. They feel that as soon as they get the job, they, oh, last time I'm going to change the world, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, how do you, how do the, how, what, what advice would you give to these individuals? Would you tell them to calm down? Would, they, would you tell them to slow down? Or would you tell them to look at everything sort of, uh, differently? It depends on their age and their experience. If they are young, they want to do things by last week or last month at my age. Actually, this is actually uh, how they look at it. Sometimes they don't calculate the consequences of a wrong move. And the impact of the wrong move when it becomes a wrong one. Actually, uh, we were trying to do a road show in Afghanistan with one of the organizations to try to start talking about building local civil society organizations. The host organization or the donor organization, which was supposed to be receiving us, agreed first, then they changed their mind. Why? Because of security. Two, three people have been killed. Uh, explosion in the, near the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the embassy, the Russian embassy, actually. The banks are not releasing the money in Afghanistan. So it becomes really very difficult. So I want to do it, but realistically, I cannot do it. We have the experience, we have the vision, we have the strategy, and we have the connection of everything. But realistically, we cannot move because of security hazard, as well as the lack of fund to do it, because the fund is frozen in the bank, and the bank are not releasing the money for this kind of activity or any activities. That's why for this, that's why I said, in the blending mixer, uh, in the blending mixer stage, we need to sit down together and to tell you what we have seen in the past, so you don't do repeat the mistake again. 
because what we our mistakes could be taken easily at that time but now it could be fatal because of the new regulation the new law the new philosophy of islamophobia and the attack on islam and muslim and others so any wrong move nowadays it's not like the wrong move actually we did uh, without knowing uh, 30 years ago because there was no this kind of counter terrorism counter extremism islamophobia at this height when you build a community obviously the community that you go to is is vast it's it's different uh, different nationalities different ideas different thoughts different everything's different there's not nobody there are no two people have the same everything uh, with what you teach and with what you give to them even if it's if it's not the humanitarian sector if it's another field even uh, how can you build a community if everybody's so divided let's say the example of Birmingham for example an amazing place but we see there's heavy divisions here in Birmingham nationalities race religion even sectarianism so how would you build a community like that and then even on a bigger scale when it comes to countries as well yeah I think when you look at the case of Birmingham or the case of uh, this multi multi faith or multi cultural society you have to be fair of treating all of them fairly you don't have to be favoring some to others you don't just talk to the Pakistani and they ignore the Indian or ignore the Bengali or the Lebanese and they ignore the Salafi or the Sufi you have to know this context Salafi Sufi all these divisions in the community have been made by us unfortunately these are the Salafis are the Sufis are the Lebanese these are the Berwi this this all these are divisive elements you have to accept everybody because you have to be objectively looking at the strategic objective we were organizing a conference in Egypt maybe 12 years ago and this was on the national scale for civil society organization from day one we have gathered Christian Muslim organizations Muslim organization even Christian with different denomination and Muslims with different schools of thought from day one you have to focus on the delivery said we are talking about Egypt we are talking about UK we are talking about Afghanistan we are talking about Pakistan or India or Bangladesh we're not talking about your organization when you come to this place forget your organization and talk about the subject the biggest strategic objective in spite of the fact that some of this organization were actually 100 million dollars a small organization I got 5 million or 2 million or 3 million but both or all treated the same but you have to let them to focus on the main objective we are going to actually to tackle the street children or to tackle the education problem affecting the young children and others huh? so forget about the achievement of your organization I don't want to hear it but I want you to give me the experience on how to do it on a national level or on a community level otherwise each one of them will be delivering a talk a PR talk about his or her own organization and this will people will find that actually you'll be favoring this organization to this organization the final question that I have is uh, fine question from him but from you yeah. start when uh, you were the CEO of Islamic Relief the being a leader has certain qualities and certain characteristics especially in an organization on that uh, scale when you have people under you uh, employees uh, staff different people even people that would just come to you for advice, they, they see you as a senior figure. Um, what, ad, what advice did you give them now, uh, then, sorry, and what advice, what would change in your approach with them now? So meaning that then you had a certain way, you had a certain strategy. What advice did you give them at that time, employees, workers, but then people now, what, what advice would you give them now that the world's changed? At the time when your organization is very small, you have to use the power of the donkey ship 
work, 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 work. And you have to be the one ahead of them. They come at nine, you are there at eight. They live at six, you are there at seven. Okay? Give them the example. Give them the Qudwa Hasana. You come from Sudan. And instead of going home, you come to the office. When you go to the office, if it's one for one hour, they believe that you value the office and the people in the office. So people will look up at what you have been doing. So show them by the example or lead them by the example. Don't lead them by giving bayan after Zuhr or after Asr or after Maghrib or giving speeches or smiling just at the face of the people. No. Something else we used to do at that time to keep asking the challenging questions. All of a sudden, you go to a room and they ask questions and they have to answer. Because they are talking with people who are going to lead the community. Don't leave them to sleep. Don't let them to all the time sit in front of a screen, be like a screen, watching a screen. Remind them all the time about the objective. The objective is the people in Sudan, the people in Afghanistan, the people in India, the people in Pakistan, the people in uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the people of Ukraine and others. Those are the people that we claim that we are their champion and we have to rise for them and remind them that your employer is not the organization, it is those people that you belong to them. The simple people who are poor, who are uneducated, who are actually taking the very simple jobs. It's not the king, not the queen, not the professor, not. The simple people actually who make you because they love you from their heart. And they wish that you will be able to grow up and there's no jealousy, there's no envy in their hearts. This is what actually you can actually lead by example for this. And be fair to everyone. Be fair to everyone. And go out to the community. Like actually, I mentioned it, I'm not sure if I mentioned it before to you or not. During Ramadan, most of the people who were running the organization, they were not in their house for the 30 days. They never had iftari with the family. They never had sahri with the family. They had iftari in different cities, different towns, even different countries to be with the people and come back at the time of Eid or even after Eid. This is the leadership by example, which will let everybody to rise to your status. I'm trying to be like yourself. This could be done, يعني, uh, not only at the beginning. Later on, you have to, uh, when, you, when the organization become mature, you have to look at the policies, the procedures, but don't ever forget the spirit of the organization. Because if you only talk about policy, procedures, and laws, and forget the spirit, it will be a static organization. It will be a dormant organization. It will be like a swamp led by some lunatics. And some of the organization, when they grew up, they relax. Actually, خلاص, we've done it. No, you relax, you become like a swamp. What will you find the swamp? Parasites, insects, whatever you call it, deadly diseases as well inside the organism. Well, that, don't say that because we are Muslims, we don't have deadly diseases. We have deadly, devastating, tsunami diseases. Allah, as Abdul Taymiyyah said, will give victory to the non-Muslim Ummah if they were fair to the people. And will never give his, uh, uh, victory to the Muslim Ummah who is not a just Ummah. It's not because you are a Muslim huh, that you get everything from Allah. You have to be applying Islam. Justice, fairness, equality is the answer. Yes. Anybody else? Open discussion. Yeah, anything doesn't have to be about this. <laughs> you, can, you can open anything.
Pandora box? You want to say something? No. Oh, okay. Yusra. Yus, huh? Bismillah. Do you want to speak? Okay. You mentioned something about um, in phases, and then you mentioned different yeah. phases, uh, the life phases. Um, I did just wonder where you said that the um, the youth needs to sit with the seniors. Are you? Uh? Um, that's right. I think that's a very difficult challenge in today's society. Time, yeah. Um, I feel like both ends don't have patience with each other mm. anymore. Um, what uh, advice would you give? I think it's. To that? The youth have to sit down with the elder. Uh, you have to be patient and you have to struggle to build the confidence. And you have to learn the language of the young people. That's why last week we were talking about uh, Generation Z. Z. I'm so Generation. She, huh? So she's giving that what we read last week. Yeah. So that generation would be baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer one or two? One, I think one. one. You remember, huh? And you are? Millennial. millennial. Between. Between millennial and Z. And Z. Yeah. So, and you? Uh, where were you born? 2003. Gen Z. Z, yeah. And you are? Seventy-seven. Are you seventy-seven years old? <laughs> Born seventy-seven. What's he? See. Yeah. That's the one before millennial. Yeah. Generation uh, X. X. Generation X. Generation X. Generation X. You are X man. <laughs> so with this, it's a struggle, and it's an art, as well. It should not be just a Maulana because it's Maulana be able to attract young people. And you've got this yeah. Big problem. Yeah. How can the young man or the young woman will be attracted to you for an hour, even every week? Yeah. You have to understand what they want and need and to challenge them. Like now, what's at the back of your mind? What are you thinking about? You are thinking about huh? Huh? food. Okay, fine. Huh? What did you say? Sky News. Sky News. Sky News. So sometimes, uh, Brother Dino, when you sit down with your friends, you discuss issues. What kind of issues do you used to discuss? Is it football? Yeah. Is it, is, is, is it football? Is it news? A personal problem of one of you? That's one thing. But amusement. Being out for uh, Shai, what do you call it? Shai Khana or Shai Khana? No, my music is way different. Because my music is to do with music and that. Music? Okay, no problem. I listen to music, but I don't be driven by music. There's different of enjoying the music, but don't let the music to drive your life. Okay? You like football? You support something. No, 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 I'm, I'm saying. But don't let the football to, la- to run your life. Mm-hmm. You, you love the, IT, the uh, f- Facebook and the others, but use it and don't be abused by it. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's why actually, if we sit down together in an open discussion and on the table you open your heart, we'll never be able, sister, to, to have this discussion of the generation build or build the earning. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, remove this generation gap unless you become honest and clear, and I become honest and clear. Mm-hmm. And I know your desire, and you know my desire. 
And sometimes it should not be in a, in a closed room. They could go out to a restaurant for a meal, maybe travel together, actually, for camping or playing football together or whatever you call it. Some people have to drink this before it becomes cold. Mm -hmm. Is this for you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you had your one? Sure. Sure. No, no, you don't anymore. Huh? You don't want another one? There's another one here. Oh, so, okay. So for this uh, sister, uh, we have to understand the psychology. Since you are a medic, the psychology of the... No, no, you are. Because if you deal with the, with the woman day in and day out, actually, you are... Yeah, yeah inshallah. If you deal with them day in and day out, you understand the psychology and the philosophy of thinking of the young people. And keep listening. Keep in to be very honest where, 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 where to start it. Start at home. By being a good friend to your children, you will understand how they think. If you don't become a very good listener to your children, unfortunately, oh, you want to say something? <laughs> you looked at her and away. No, I'm saying uh, I won't bring up us. Huh? I'm saying I won't bring up us. Alhamdulillah. And this, this, mom should be a friend. Dad should be a friend, but the closest friend to you should be mom. Because she is more compassionate. Sorry, dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dad, but actually... I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. The burden was a reward. So basically what you're trying to say, what I got from it, is unjudgmental listening. That's right. And then by the youth, it's sincere. Sincerity. Yeah. So when yeah. you approach... The seniors, don't be done in sincerity. Yes. And when the seniors approach the youth, they should use unjudgmental wisdom. Because by the time you're a senior, I feel like you become very certain in your ways. And if anybody comes and they give you just a simple sentence, it stirs you up very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then that bitterness and angry, anger comes out very quick by the seniors. Mm -hmm. So if they can have that unjudgmental listening where they can hold their emotions and yeah. say, okay, let's see what they have to say. Yeah. Learn the art of listening. Learn the art of listening, especially daddy and mommy and others. And learn the art of not pushing your mother and your father to the cliff of the edge. Actually. Because sometimes it could be, could be over demanding. Which you don't have the facilities, the resources, the time. And you know, because you are a part of the member of the, are a member of the family. But listening is very important and uh, learn from them and sit down not as a teacher but as a colleague. Sometimes my children become very upset with me because I used to give lectures. So I lectured them. So, Daddy, stop lecturing us. Keep, keep saying, and they, now they are actually in the mid 20s and mid 30s. Stop lecturing us. Enough now. Enough is enough. We have been. Uh, يعني خلاص بقى يعني finished يعني وار are grown up and they have their children and their husband or their wives but unfortunately sometimes I fail and they do this so don't act with them as a teacher and the best thing for anyone who would like to bridge the gap is to listen that's why uh, one of the things which was very successful that we made uh, after I left the Islamic Leaf to create another organization called the Humanitarian Forum. Humanitarian Forum was a bridge between the Muslims and non-Muslims globally. And we organized 14 international consultations from Indonesia to South Africa to Yemen to Syria before the war to others. You know, we made no agenda meeting. The discussion should be made by the local. Because we want to know the problems affecting the local community. For us, we are visitors. We cannot just go and be judgmental on the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you understand, the way you treat your problems. Just listen. And let them to talk with their local language. Whether Turkish, or Urdu, or Punjabi, or Gujarati, or Bihasa, 
or Malay, and somebody will translate later on. So this let us to manage to organize this 14, and you know what? The outcome of the 14 consultation globally were the same. Exactly the same. We want capacity building to build our capacity. We want to understand the humanitarian standard. We want to do the good governance, how to run the organization. We want actually to good governance and uh, what else? Uh, bridge building, to bridge the gap between us and the others. And number five, uh, community and networking. Community, communications, communication and networking. Well, it all came from Pakistan to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to South Africa, the same, because we asked the community to speak about themselves. And the problems are the same wherever you are. Listen. Yes, Dino. You know James Dean? Well, the top movie star in the 50s. My generation. He used to have this big hair. With the... What was he? What he died? He died actually in a car accident. Huh? Huh? Alvis later on. Alvis the, the, the king. She knows Alvis. Huh? <laughs> yes, she she knows the history. Huh? He used to go the king or the prince. Alvis king. Yeah. Yes. I'm the generation of Mr. Beans. <laughs> Beans. <laughs> Yes, Bismillah. Hit me with something. Go on. Yes, yes. Uh, Yusra. There is a general principle shared between Muslims and non-Muslims. Like the respect, uh, protecting the dignity or honoring the dignity of everybody, being honest, being transparent, being fair, being empowering. We started accommodating non-Muslims in the organization from the 90s, very early days. Because we wanted to be an organization that bring everybody to the table. And everybody should have the same. We're not bringing them to convert them. We're bringing them because they have added value. Whether they are accountants, or having project management skills, or they are lawyers, or whatever you call it in this. I'm not bringing him or her because she's a Muslim, or he's a Muslim. Even the Muslims. Different schools of thought. The Dibandi, the Salafi, the Jamaat Islami. You are here as a humanitarian worker. I'm not interested very much in your school of thought because we are all objectively addressing one issue. How can we fight poverty? How can we tackle problems of education? Children problems. And that, as we discussed before, a humanitarian response, training the people. All this objectively has to be the focus. So whether the man is a Muslim or the woman is a non-Muslim, it doesn't make any difference. Some of those non-Muslims, Bismillah, mashallah, I give you the example when I was in uh, Kenya, uh, I think three years ago, before, يعني, before COVID, or at the beginning of COVID. No, actually, even 2022 or 2020, end of 2021. One of them was called Gloria. Even I made a, a lecture about her. Actually, she was not a Muslim, or she's not a Muslim, she's Christian. She's a young girl. And when I met her in the office, she said, 
those people are going to the office. I'm not going to the office because of COVID. Her boss told me that, and she, she confirmed that. We made the lockdown in the office for three months. We said, God, hold on. People are dying in different parts of Kenya. How on earth that we sit at home and using only the computer? They decided to break the regulation or the rule done to them by the head office. And they started to travel between different cities because the need is magnanimous. Whether she's a Muslim or not Muslim. You know what she told me? She told me during Ramadan, I was fasting with our brothers and sisters. And I was driving in the car, I was in the car for about 18 hours to reach this village while fasting. I did not ask her to fast. We did not ask her to fast. Some other brothers said we've been traveling for about 20, 30 hours to reach the people. Even with HSBC, Amana department, which in the good old days, actually, going to Amana was actually dealing with uh, uh, the Islamic finance of, or the Islamic department of the HSBC. It's closed, the, unfortunately, this department is closed down now. The, 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 the director of this department decided to fast the whole of Ramadan with us. We're not talking about his intention. But you know what he said? He said, Subhanallah. He did not say Subhanallah. I said Subhanallah. <laughs> he said, Yeah, oh God, I felt that my body is more lighter. My spirit is clearer. And my vision is clearer. It is fasting changed and reformed my life. He does not understand the philosophy of the fasting and the power of the fasting on the body and the link between the fasting man or woman and Allah to cleanse the soul and the mind and the body at the same time. That was his reaction. He said, I would like to be fasting like all of you. So don't show Islam to those people by lecturing them, but by your behavior. That's why Prophet Muhammad has been described, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, uh, he said I've been sent not in any arrogant way to complete or to fulfill the best of good manner that means to complete that means that the prophet the prophet before him started the journey here you look at the modesty and the humility of the prophet to complement what has been done by prophets before me. He used to say the resemblance for me and my brethren, which is Adam, alayhi salam, uh, Ibrahim, Nuh, Isa, and others, is like this big house, beautiful palace, beautiful, beautiful. Everybody passing by, oh, beautiful, very well built, apart from a cornerstone, which is missing. And everybody was saying, Ah, oh, if somebody can put this cornerstone. You know what he said? I am this stone. He admitted that he came to complete the missions of other prophets. Surely. And this actually for us should be there. So Gloria said, I traveled for 18 hours. We have a lot of good Christian brothers and sisters working very hard extremely hard to defend the Muslim organization because they talk about fairness, they talk about justice, they talk about advocacy. They are not talking about uh, uh, Islamizing or Christianizing individuals. And they see the truth. I tell you something. Uh, so she is exciting me. Now actually you kept it quiet, quiet, quiet. Now you psh. The one who supported us to register Islamic Leaf at United Nations. Did I mention this before? I was in this high-level meeting 1993. Last few days of Ramadan in March 1993. And they were planning to register Islamic Leaf at UN. Then, alhamdulillah, has my two colleagues, uh, both of them in Birmingham. One of them was young, originally Yemeni. 
The second one was originally uh, Indian and it was revert. Both of them are, are living in Birmingham. And uh, Brother Khalid was actually very expert because he had more senior knowledge. He discussed with us all the questions which could be asked. Next day, subhanallah, whatever Khalid mentioned the night before, it was asked next day. And my answer was my long beard. This is small. You know, my beard is longer than you. Where did he come from? He's... <laughs> and uh, I answered all the questions. Then one of the ambassadors in the room said, I want to read his uh, about, about this organization. I did not understand what lobbying is, what advocacy is, what, 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 what. Then an Egyptian woman was there in the meet in, in the room, told me, You are Egyptian? I said, Yes, how do you know? I said, You speak like me. <laughs> what do you mean? You look like me and you speak like me. Go and do lobbying. That means that you go and speak to all the ambassadors individually. The Russian, the Costa Rican, the French, and all those. Ones. I started. By Friday, I, there was no answer. We started on Monday. New York was very expensive. Uh, a room which was two by two, actually 70, 80 dollars a night. At that time, it was very expensive for, for our budget. And uh, I went to the stage without any permission. You, are, you can imagine that. Big room with all the ambassadors, and I'm sit, standing on the stage, holding the microphone, said, hey guys, what's going on with you? The chairwoman told me, sir, please go down in a very polite way. I said, I'm not going to go down. I answered all your questions. I gave you all the reports you want. Okay? And what's wrong with you? I said, sir. I said, nothing called sir. Because they wanted me to, they wanted to put Islamic Reef on a roster status. Come after two years. I approached three Arab Ambassadors, they did that to me. Turned their back. Huh? Said, oh my God. You know, on that Friday, which I think 29th or 30th of, of March, 1993, the Irish ambassador took the microphone and said, I recommend Islamic Relief. They have provided us with all the necessary information and, 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 and. And they gave a very powerful speech to support us. So it was actually a Catholic, Christian individual who stood up to get Islamic Relief registers at UN in 1993. And I mentioned the three Arabs were Muslims. One of them told me, go and come back after two years. Your name as Islamic Thief is agonizing us. So what do you want me to do? To change my face, to change my name, to shave my beard? Oh, it's finished. We apply it, finished. We got the registration. Because Allah decided, then he used the non-Muslim to support us. Don't look at all the non-Muslims as their one block. There are many good people amongst them. Like actually in Muslims, many good people, but there's some bad apples as well. Hmm. Mm. Do you know you are thinking somewhere else? Yeah, Bismillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, the, 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 the Pharaoh is, is, is speaking. You know, the Pharaoh of Egypt started to speak after 4,000 4, years. <laughs> I was thinking first. Of course. I know that you are, you are a thinker or sinker. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you a very broad question. Uh, we can go to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see as the future of Islam in Britain? It depends on the Muslims. You see, you cannot just go to Catch-22 without doing uh, your job. If the Muslims are engaged, if the Muslims are educated, if the Muslims are progressive, if the Muslims know their deen, if the Muslims know their rights, if the Muslims are connected together and united, 
having one platform will be able to have an impact. Because if you talk about our Jewish brothers and sisters, there are actually three, four hundred thousand people. But the impact is very powerful because they learn to build an institution to lobby any government. They have the economy, they have the media, they have the law. So they're very specialized in, eco in, any, uh, in, in economy, in media, in law. So, and they have the connection, the global connection. And they are actually connected to the establishment, not only to the government. We are four million people divided and fighting one over one another on this mosque or this mosque or this group or these groups. Because we are not united. Don't fight one another. The fight will let you fail. Your failure will let your power to, to go in vain. Alas, I'm fighting him. Instead of me and him sitting together and going together, alas, he's leaving me alone, taking his army or his group or his people away from me. That's why the art of communication networking, it becomes a compelling necessity at the moment. Let me take you back to the 80s when I came to Birmingham. Most of these big mosques were not mosques. Were not mosques. Only the central mosque and the rest were houses. Only Ahl Hadith started in the late 80s when they bought this uh, library in, in Greenland. The rest were called Tablighi, Diobandi, uh, Brelwi and others. You used to go to the central mosque on Eid, five or six prayers, led by each imam of different school of thought. Even if the code of this is different, the sisters' code of this is different, the speech is different, and, and, and. and seriously, I, I observed this. Now, each one of them has got his own mosque, or their own mosques. Some of the schools of thought have got more than one mosque in the city. And we are here. They are here. The more we have money, the more we divide our community. Unfortunately, this was happening. So if you, if you reverse it back to the golden days of the 80s, you find we were more united because we had less resources. But now because we have more resources, we become more divided. Unless we sit down objectively in a very transparent way, and sit down together, will never have any impact on Europe or in even in the backyard of our house. Yes, sir? Now, you have to ask me a question. Otherwise, how can I pay for the, what do you call this one? The latte. latte. Daddy, ask me a question. He's my daddy now. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, you know what? One day I used to have hair like you, but gone with the wind. He is going from incubator to donkeyship. Yes. So what advice would you give on that? <laughs> I think Dean has to, Dean and his sisters have to realize that the bright future is not giving to the people who, who will chill out. Because I know this discussion at home. We want to chill out. <laughs> we want to relax. You are serious, daddy. Why don't you smile? Why don't you I mean, relax? Go and take mommy for a, like I, I saw a movie, Egyptian movie, which was called the Black Honey. You know that, huh? That's a lesson. That's a lesson. And in Egypt, the income is very minimum. And the man was, uh, was his wife was living in a flat with his mother-in-law and six or seven children. And he did not 
uh, uh, practice the matrimonial relationship with his wife for four months. And a visitor came from like him, from America, was Egyptian, but he's in America, and they think American. And they're telling this man who has his income maybe 50 or 60 Egyptian pounds a month. Said, guy, you know what? Said, what? You take your wife and go to Holland. You take your wife and go to Spain. You take your wife and go to France for holiday. The man looked at him and said, get lost. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the money even to go to, 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 to a picnic in the city. And they tell me, go to Holland, Spain, and, and tell, I told him, if you don't stop being, uh, uh, what do you call it, idiot and stupid, I'll sort you out. Actually, this is what we actually we need to be realistic. Realistic. So going back to your question, what was your question? Advice for in between the transition yeah. to I tell you something. Uh, no, forget about me. If you want to have a brighter future, you have to have a hard life during your young age. You have to work hard to relax later on. The people who chill will never be able to have this kind of easy and prosperous life. Difficult life at the younger age means you study more, you work hard to get the highest job and the highest income. Once you have the highest income and there's a situation, you'll be able actually to buy the house, to buy the car, to take your family and children here and there. But the people who, ch who chill more, alas, finished. There's nothing in the future for them. There'll be there will be, uh, what do you call it? Uh, somebody will be ahead of them. i tell you something. Look at the football, which could, you know, not a football supporter. Anyone? No. Wallah al azim. Why am I living? Where am I living? Huh? Anybody for football? Anybody for football? Are you living in England or what? Are you living in UK or living somewhere? <laughs> Uh, cricket, are you for cricket? No. Yeah, oh is. my god. <laughs> if you don't train very much from the younger age, I remember one of the superstars from Pakistan team, superstar, he said at the age of eight, my father or my uncle used to take me from A to B to C to D. So I loved the cricket. Now I am a superstar. We did not have food at how at home, but my uncle was actually my father was taking me to this. So he let him to believe that he can become, become superstar. Now he's a superstar. If this young boy was not actually trained very well at his younger age, he would never become superstar. Muhammad Ali Clay, you know Muhammad Ali, yeah? you know him, huh? The boxers. Have you heard of him? He won the world championship. In the Olympic, not, not the, the Olympic championship, at the age of twenty. Okay, this is the goal. Then he won the world heavyweight championship at the age of twenty-one or twenty-two or twenty-three, against either Sonny Liston or somebody else, and he impressed Islam in public. From the age, this is the donkey ship now, mm -hmm. twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Muhammad Ali, the way he was training himself was incredible. He was being stripped of his title and he came back to win it three times because he refused to go to fight against Vietnamese in the 60s. And somebody said that, oh my God, the most prestigious uh, championship is the heavyweight, boxing heavyweight. And he came back and won and won and won. Then he became the icon, not only for the Muslim, but for humanity. When they wanted to honor him in Hollywood, everybody putting his, their names on the, on the floor. Walk of fame. Huh? Walk of fame. Yeah, he said, yeah that, that actually. He told them no. My name should not be on the floor because it carries the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Don't put it on the floor, put it on the wall. That's why Muhammad Ali is living with us. 
He was fighting for his race. He was fighting for his identity. He was fighting for his religion. And he was fighting for profession. And Allah gave him the ability to be very good narrator and communicator. Ali. Muhammad Ali. I remember seeing him in Egypt in the 60s when he came to Egypt in his journey. And instead of letting him to fight against one Egyptian, they got three Egyptians to fight him, one after one. <laughs> and he was very soft with them. And all the people in the stadium who said, Muhammad Ya Ali, they were not, were not supporting the Egyptian. Very strange. <laughs> were supporting Muhammad Ali. This is how Muhammad Ali became an icon. This is how Malcolm X became an icon. This is how this is, uh, Malik Shabazz. This is how Martin Luther King became an icon. This is how Nelson Mandela became an icon. Because they work very hard. Now their mission is there. This is how Che Guevara in Argentina became an icon. He was from a middle class family as a medical doctor. And he decided to go and fight for the human rights of the Argentinians in the mine fields. Actually, the mine workers, as well as after that, he went to Africa and came back. And he was killed by actually uh, the, the, the security at that time. This is the way. If you want to have a, a bright future, you have to have a very serious life when you are young. I don't say that you don't have to, to uh, have some pleasure. You have some pleasure. But balance between the achievement and the time for the pleasure which I can see you in 20 years when you invite me to your palace and give me one of your Ferrari as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> Ferrari or uh, uh, Bentley? Bentley or Bentley. Ferrari? Bentley. Bentley. Was, yeah, you, you, know, you, you know, they open it this way, the doors. Oh. I went to one of my, oh, one of my friends, Pakistani, Bismillah, mashallah, without mentioning his name, he was taking me to London. I was just going to open the door. I found it open the open. What's going on? <laughs> open oppositely. He was ringing me here for this meeting uh, next Saturday. I told him, uh, I'm going to, uh, what is this? I don't know how to, to, to be in your car. He said, don't worry. You get in and they'll close the door automatically. Because I'm somebody who will go talk about the donkeys. <laughs> Here's somebody going to talk about. And he is one of those people who are actually still observing the donkey ships at the age of 60. Because he's a businessman, he's committed Muslims, and he's con connected to the bigger community as Muslims and the larger community as the Muslims. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And please, now you are like a sponge. It needs to have a lot of water which means experience, knowledge inside it. So to give you the confidence to go to the second stage. All of us are like this. And the first source of water or nourishment to us when we are kids is the mother. Then the father. Then the bigger family. The grandparents and uncles and aunties. Then the community. But the more you work hard, the more when you are young, the more you'll be able to have a relaxing life or more relaxing life when you are older. And when you join a new job, go to the job which you find your boss can teach you. Don't go to a job which is a very well established organization. You'll be like this tool on a conveyor belt and nobody will have the time to teach you. I have I heard this from a, a Chinese multi-billionaire, I can't remember his name. He said, I advise the younger people at the age of 20, 25 to go to join a company where the, the chairman or the boss is there to teach them. Mm -hmm. But if they go to a big and very established com company, they will never learn because they just follow the path, mm -hmm. like actually a tool. So when you get your degree, get somebody to teach you in your job. I think yesterday I was talking to one of my colleagues in London, 
for Muslim charities forum because we are recruiting the younger graduate to become intern. The demand is very high and they have to refuse some of them. It's nine months experience, hands on, but who is teaching? One of my brothers, my younger brother, who started with us, uh, Fadi, you don't know Fadi Atari, you know him? Yeah. And Fadi, he is mentoring them. And they bring a lot of people to keep mentoring them. And Alhamdulillah, most of them got a job after or before the nine months. So get the one job which will teach you. So you find people at my age will have the time for you to teach you. Yeah. Yes, sister, brothers, you didn't ask. So oh, okay, I think that tomorrow. <laughs> Daddy, well, we are quiet. He's going to pay the bill, huh? <laughs> Do you huh? Have advice to uh, you woke a person to how he like the wake up caller? Yeah. Go on. Like how he like uh, perform his role as a woke up person. I think you start to advise people when you have the knowledge of how to advise them. You started to teach when you learn and you become educated. Okay. Sometimes the ignorant people think that they can teach. They are arrogant. But actually, for somebody humble like yourself, you keep absorbing this knowledge over the period of the donkey ship. And even from the time of your parents, when you are actually in the first seven years incubated by your mother, or the second seven years when you are incubated by both parents. But actually, during focus on the 20 years of donkeyship, with an objective to learn as much as you can, to obtain organic experience as much as you can, then you will be able to teach. And the most important thing in these 20 years is to show humility and being humble. Being humble. Because a community will accept the uh, humble wake-up caller. Not the most learned, educated, arrogant wake-up caller. Mm -hmm. The simple wake-up caller. You see, I was giving a talk uh, in, in, in Istanbul about Simple people. Simple people are the people who are cleaning our houses, cleaning our schools, guarding our houses, driving our cars, the buses and coaches and trains. Okay? Cleaning the road, collecting the rubbish, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Simple people. Simple people are those people that you don't feel that they are with you, like the soldiers at the border. Like the security men who stand up at night to protect you. Simple people. You know who also are simple people? The prophets, the reformers, and the great people. All of them were simple people. Simple people was Isa, السلام, was Musa, السلام, was Ibrahim, السلام, was Yusuf, السلام, are simple people. Was Muhammad, السلام, simple people. Why you act? as a complicated man or a complicated woman. Why? And you tell me that I'm a Muslim. Follow the simple man who was the teacher of the teachers of humanity. Because he was a very simple man. You can see how he slept, how he woke up, how he got dressed, how he behaved with his wives, with his colleagues, with his community, and with the enemies. Simple people. And this is the character of being the character of the Prophet Hood of you becoming a simple man or simple woman. So if you don't, or we don't become simple people, we cannot rise, and the community cannot elevate us to the highest level. Simple girl. Simple. Yes, say it. Yes, what? Yeah. Simple. I, 
I tell you something in, in the in, in the football. The one of the best players in the 60 years he was Irish, used to be called George Best. George Best can you remember the time of George Best? He was the no, best. Read a bit about him, like. Uh, yeah. He was very at hand, very handsome and surrounded by and drinking all this kind of thing. And he used to take the ball, the football, and can go through everybody. But he failed to score. So he was very talented, but he did not use his talent. So be the one who be simple, but score the goal. Have a strategy. What do you want? You want to win the three points. Not by actually taking these people right, left, and center. Then everybody will say, hey, Dino is the best player, but where's the goal? There's no goal. <laughs> so... Not George Best. Now you look at uh, Mo Salah, you look at who else uh, in the league? Kane, what the Kane? Uh, Hurricane. Hurricane. And look at Cristiano Ronaldo as his age. He's still, uh, no, he's not, not in the donkey ship. He's still, no, no, not in the donkey ship. Uh, he's still working. <laughs> in the donkey ship, he's still in the, because he's 37, 38. Yeah. But he, because he has, a, a, he have this mission of become one of the best players or top players. He's still keeping himself fit at this age. When you look back at Daruni, you know Daruni from Manchester United. Mm-hmm. He's now is looked like an old man, and Daruni is is younger actually than uh, uh, what 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 team is uh, support? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, oh, no, none of them. <laughs> Liverpool. The liver and the pool, huh? <laughs> okay. So, any more questions on? Yes. Okay, Jazakum Allah Khair. Maybe next week, if you all have a subject to discuss, I'm available. Give them, and make me give them your uh, telephone or give them my telephone. And if they want to make, send a message, we can discuss it. Actually, to benefit from you and what you want, especially this brother Dino. I'm going to focus on you to have my hair grow, <laughs> grow back again. <laughs> I want my hair back. I'll invite a diary on the incubator. Yeah, he's at the last inch of the incubator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Jazakum Allah Khair. Maybe brother will thank also brother uh, Maulana uh, Mikael if you can close with the, with the Quran. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم بالمؤمنين رؤوف فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ 